This is the Colonel Rad Alert. Civil defense information will be broadcast at 640. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Y2K, how can we prepare? Stop a few of their machines and radios. Throw them into darkness for a few hours. We are fighting for our lives. My family must survive. Boom for five years. Thousand gallons of gas. Air filtration, water filtration. Coming at you from the frozen tundra that is East Central Alberta, Canada. Streaming live on YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, Rumble, and Odyssey. Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. I am Toolman Tim. Today is October the 30th, 2023, and this is episode 391 of Workshop Radio. And guys, it's going to be a good one tonight. I got my buddy Will waiting in the wings. He is in the green room eating M&Ms and, uh, of course, only the blue ones because he requested that in his rider before we started. But we're going to have him on in just a minute. Uh, yes, probably only the second time we've had a filmmaker on here, so I'm kind of excited. He's going to come on and share some of his uh, ups and downs and journey and a lot of his favorite horror because this will be the third Halloween-themed episode because we're quickly heading from ghouls to Santa Claus. So real quick, let's get the announcements out of the way, guys. Number one, you want to support the workshop and the things that I do. I'm a big fan of value for value exchange. And the easiest way to do that is to sign up for the Patch of the Month Club. That's patchofthemonth.co, not .com. If you go there, it won't show up. .co, 10 bucks a month, $100 a year. You get a patch just like it's on my hat every single month. But more than that, it's a way to support what I do and uh, keep the lights on and the generators fueled up. We got us. I see Spags over there. Good to see you. And by the way, folks, we are on a completely different evening because we wanted to get one more spooky episode in. Number two, I get asked tons of the time, Tim, do you recommend blah, blah, blah? Tim, do you have a product used for this? Do you? Yeah. Yes. The answer is probably. Toolmantim.shop. Go there and you'll see I've got, right now, it's about a couple hundred products that I've reviewed. I've got the links up. And if you pick something up through the Amazon shop, you're all set. And then one more quick thing, guys. I know it's two months away. Well, I don't know. We're getting close to Christmas. But last year, I wanted to start a new Christmas kind of theme for the show. Everybody else, you know, my, my good friend, Nicole, from Living Free in Tennessee, she did the, she does um, the night before Christmas from all across the world. And I thought, what could we do here that would fit this kind of our thrust of this channel. And I came up with it. it. Took me some digging, but there is an episode of King of the Hill. Stick with me here, guys, for just a minute. From 1999 called Hillenium. And it is the entire uh, King of the Hill crew getting ready for the Y2K bug. Love the episode. But more than that, I took the script. I turned it into an audio podcast. And I thought, eh, it's okay. But how could we up it this year? And what I decided was we're going to get members of the community, fellow delinquents, to do the voices. And I have tons of people signed up for all the voices already, except, now these are tough. One of them's easy, random obnoxious computer store worker. So if you're interested in that voice, let me know. But the one I'm really looking for is a Boomhauer. That one can be tricky. I know. I try to do Boomhauer, but I'd probably have to be drunk or something. Anyway, reach out to me, therealtimcook at gmail.com or just let me know in the Telegram group because will I do them? Sure, I'll do them. But I would love to put it together with 100% delinquent uh, participation. So with that, guys, give me one second here. Let's bring on Will. How are you, Will? Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Great. Is this our Great Christmas? Evening. Halloween? Christmas. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah. I guess you could say that. It's, yeah. One, probably my favorite holiday of the year. Me too. It's. I don't know, when we were kids, Halloween was fun, you know, but they people didn't decorate so much. You know, everybody did their costumes and stuff. There was a there was always the odd house that decorated, but now it seems to be one of those things that people jump into just every bit as much as Christmas, doesn't it? Oh yeah, right, right. I think um you know, I was always into making my own costume to some degree, you know, but uh it seems like uh you know, now there's I mean, what spirit Halloween, uh, you know, is in every I mean every town and uh it, yeah it's a huge industry now like well like christmas i guess but uh do you remember oh, yeah, any of your what was your favorite do it yourself halloween costume when you were a kid i like uh, that it's good. oh well i did one i had this character that i drew I, I i used to do like comics 
okay. when I was in like middle school, high uh, high school. And I had this character that was like this this uh, smiley face, uh, just kind of silent, creepy <laughs> character. So I dressed up like that one year, and uh, I found it was an interesting experiment because it was the it was it turned it was like the most unsettling, like scary, uh, you know, character. Just because I was completely silent all night, I just had a card that said trick or treat, and uh, on the other side said thank you and. And the people I was trick or treating with just got progressively more creeped out over the, the course of the <laughs> evening. <clears throat> Even though so, you know they were friends and family. Why don't you share with us? Because um, I don't know if many people in the workshop would know who Will is, unless you've been to. Uh, so okay, look, I'm going to back up. You can tell when we first met. I think I remember, but I call him my supplier of Christmas juice. So <laughs> yeah. how did we first meet, Will? And and then get into your story a little bit. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, the Christmas juice was the key. It, uh, so it was at SRF the last fall. Um, so the Christmas juice, first of all, it's, uh, it, the official name is, uh, it's called, it's Nocino. It's this, uh, it's an Italian liqueur that a friend of mine, uh, turned me on to it. He found his grandpa's old recipe and, and he shared it with a couple of friends of, of mine and I, and, and we've been making batches of it the last few years. And so I brought some to share and, and uh, yeah, you, you seem to like it pretty well. And I took. Let's just say I took a shining to it. <laughs> yeah, everybody, everybody that tries it seems to love it, and and uh, it's it's really fun. We we you it's there's a whole you know lore around it and tradition and stuff. I won't get into, but you make it in the summer, uh, and it's usually ready around Christmas time, and then you kind of you know it it develops as it as it uh, sits for you know two three years. It you know it just gets better and better, but um uh we've been uh my friends and i we've been adding like odd uh what uh ad ad adulterations i guess and uh doing a lot of experimenting with the, the the base recipe and that's been really fun we get together and have a you know big group tasting a couple times a year and but it's fun to like introduce it to new people it and, uh, it would be a liqueur I, would i be wrong to say it's kind of a clove based liqueur it's well it's really, I think, yeah, the clove is probably the strongest flavor, but it's, um, it has the, the kind of the, its main identity, I would say, is, is walnut. Uh, cause uh, yeah. It's, yeah, like that's, that's kind of the key ingredient. It's, it, and the, it's black, like, so it's actually, it, it's kind of appropriate for Halloween too, I guess. It looks, it looks like a, a nice dark, uh, but, it, but it tastes like Christmas. So, um, but yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, clove, cinnamon, lemon peel, walnut. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's a really interesting, uh, warm, you know, kind of, you know, festive. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> Get you feeling festive pretty quick. Yeah. So where did your, because we also discovered at this self-reliance, I think that we have a, a mutual love for film and uh, yeah. horror film in general, which is awesome. So where did your, where did your kind of love for film start? Where did, where did that, uh, kick off? Well, uh, it's always been, my mom, uh, was always, really into into movies uh like well rending well so you know i'm a child of the 80s so you know a, as soon as vhs hit the scene i guess we were my mom i think she even worked at a at a video rental store so we were like always you know when having a vhs vh uh uh what, what is it? a vcr yeah uh wasn't common we would you know borrow the one from this the store i think and and uh bring home some tapes and and I started uh, in particular with horror early, like probably my earliest film memory. I think, well, my earliest uh, theater memory was seeing Ghostbusters in the theater. Oh, yes. And and uh, and crying when the, the librarian uh, like rushed it because I was, you know, four or five years old or whatever, you know. Uh, but I remember it fondly aside from that. Uh, and then at home, I remember, uh, again, when I was five, probably four or five, maybe six, you know, watching uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 uh, wow. on VHS at home with my mom and my aunt, uh, who is just like three years older than me, and eating burritos and, and, and just, I mean, my mom was always, would always say, you know, don't, this is all, you know, make believe, that's just, that's just makeup, that's just, you know, special effects, it's not real, and so it was just a fun time, you know, especially a movie like that, that just, it is so crazy, and, uh, you know, it is funny. <laughs> Absolutely. I just wanted to mention there might be when you move around your mic wires 
might be rubbing on. They're just making a look, not a big deal, but I figured we'd catch it before we got too far into it. So, oh, absolutely. For the record, my first movie I ever saw was uh, VHS. Same thing. We went and rented a, v, a VCR, <laughs> and uh, it, this is not not nearly as cool, but it was Ernest Goes to Camp. Oh yeah. Oh yes. no, that's great. I love the Ernest movies. Yeah, I think. He, well, oh, go ahead. No, no, I just I was going to make a stupid dad joke. I was going to say he was really earnest in his roles, wasn't he? Yes, so, yes. Yeah. yeah, well, and I, uh, you guys mentioned him on that, uh, you know, last episode, I think uh, uh, Ernest Scared Stupid, I think, came up. Yes. And, and yeah, I, I think whenever year that came out, I was maybe 14. I, uh, we, I, that was my birthday. Uh, went, went to the theater, see Ernest Scared Stupid, you know, went out to dinner. And- I'm. <laughs> Another one I've never seen. I've heard it's great for kids and a lot of fun. And it, but it, some people say it was might have been his best film, which you know probably isn't saying a ton. But it's neither here nor there now, is it? So, yeah. so where did it where did it go? Along? I mean, geez, you couldn't if you started on Texas Chainsaw Massacre at five years old. <laughs> where yeah. do you go from there? Well, uh, so another very early memory around that time, um, I think. I don't think you, she could even get it at the video store, but she had a friend that was had all these you know crazy movies. Uh, she got a copy of Evil Dead, the first one. Oh yes, and um, and I remember that was too intense for her. Like we we didn't finish watching it, you know. And of course, I was pretty freaked out too because she was freaked out. But um, you know, and later, you know, now you know Sam Raimi and and the Evil Dead movies are you know some of my favorites. I my favorite is the second one because i think it's like the perfect balance of the horror and the comedy you know which i i yeah i love that they kind of yeah. figured it out at that point i mean they were if you ever hear the story of the making of the i mean i'm sure you have but for the sake of other people i mean it was an unbelievable source uh i mean <laughs> they they were you know maxing out credit cards taking out loans the story goes that they may or may not have even burnt down the cottage at the end who knows but they they were learning as they went and I, yeah, I love them. And, oh yeah, and have that's, you seen the new one? No, I haven't. Um, I saw the what, like ten plus years ago. There was that kind of remake or reboot. Yes, I saw that one, but I haven't seen any of the. I think has there been two since then? So I don't. Well, the latest one just came out this summer, and it was Evil Dead Rises, and it was oh so good. I it was as good. I mean, it really fell into the vein of over the top gore blood everywhere but also humor involved mm. oh, so nice. it was yeah <laughs> yeah i think all the trailers seem like it it didn't uh highlight any of the uh the humor i think it I was know. maybe i mean it might not have been quite as funny as uh say the second of the original but it was i i laughed in many occasions and it was mm. yeah it was definitely more over the top like the last one was just pure gore. You know, it mm-hmm. almost felt like it was coming into like hostile territory almost just, you know, violent for the sake of violence. Right. Whereas yeah. this one definitely, at least to me, held on to the spirit of it for sure. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I definitely need to check that out. I've kind of, I have been kind of <laughs> running myself ragged for the last few years and I, I, I hardly watch anything anymore. Like all my references are, you know, 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. And all my favorite movies are from the seventies and eighties. So, oh, well, we'll get, I want to hear about those, but I want to hear, how did you, because you sent me a couple of short, short films mm-hmm. that you filmed, what, close to 15 years ago now, was it? Or Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, and I guess ahead. kind of getting back to, I guess my journey or whatever. Uh, so, um, I was always a movie fan. Actually, one kind of cool thing that I, again, just kind of going back to childhood, um, my I tr- we traveled a lot. And one thing, when we would be sitting somewhere for a long time waiting for, you know, whatever, um, my mom would tell us stories. She would recount the, the plots of movies as if oh. she was, you know, like telling the story. And I remember, you know, being in, you know, like on a layover in an airport somewhere and, and, uh, and she told us the whole plot to The Shining, you know, and uh, and I, I remember the year that uh, Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade came out, we had seen the trailer and then we had gone off on this trip and we couldn't see the, the movie. So we all just 
told each other our, you know, what we imagined the movie would be. We made up our own version of it based on the trailer, you know, and like, that was some, that was, I always loved that, you know? Uh, and I feel like, you know, that probably contributed to me, you know, like wanting to become a director and a writer and stuff. Cause we were kind of creating these stories in our minds and, uh, and that's kind of, you know, how I operate, you know, I see, I see everything, you know, before it goes up. That makes <laughs> sense. The I, that's cool. I, yeah, I like that idea. That's something kids wouldn't do today. Today we'd want to have, you know, a full movie outline and spoilers and everything else. But uh, I like that trying to base your story on uh, what, what the trailer says. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and uh, so anyway, I, I didn't really do my, I didn't have a camera like until my, I got one as a graduation present uh, when I graduated from high school and it was a VHSC, you know? Uh, yes. <laughs> so pretty, pretty low quality. Um, but we immediately, uh, I had actually already written a script uh, with a friend of mine um, and we were, we tried to borrow my mom's camera, but it got broken. Uh, and um and we and we had this other friend that was always shooting stuff, you know, so we were we were making stuff, but I never had much creative control, you know, um, uh, and we mostly were just improvising things. But um, our first actual script was actually going back to Ch Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I don't know how we decided to do it, but um, and this is back in the day when you'd get, you know, seven movies for seven bucks for seven days or whatever, you know, those, those yeah. video rental deals. And we would, of course, that would be our whole weekend. You know, we'd get, get the, you know, seven movies on Friday and we'd watch them all by Saturday. And we just, um, and, and he was like, uh, he, this guy, he was like one of my main collaborators, you know, and best friends throughout high school. And we started a band and, you know, and we're still good friends, but, um, he was like kind of very sheltered. Uh, he wasn't allowed to watch horror movies or anything growing up. And so I kind of, I was a bad influence and I in, introduced him to all this stuff. And, and, uh, and I guess he, I think it was probably his idea. We, we were going to remake the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, but we were going to make it a, a comedy uh, and more gory. And so I like watched it like frame by frame, like, with the you know pause button on the VCR and and I like wrote down by hand you know long hand uh, you know every shot every piece of dialogue and you know and then we typed it up and when we typed it up we added a bunch of scenes that were like our sort of comedy scenes that were just kind of interspersed okay um, and in, in our version uh, Franklin was the main character he's the guy in the wheelchair. Um, and you know, it's Franklin and Sally are brother, sister, and then there's Kirk and Pam are the other two teens that are, you know, get killed. Um, and, uh, our version just, it was this bizarre, like, uh, surreal thing. And we ended up shooting all of our original scenes and we never shot any of the, like the recreation scenes or the, the remake scenes and like Leatherface and none of the family actually showed up in our Oh yeah, in the version that we shot. Uh, so it was just, it was just, it was like Franklin and Sally and Kirk and Pam, you know, as kids just getting into bizarre situations, and they all did end up dying, I, uh, but uh, in in a very different ways. <laughs> Does that still exist anywhere, or did it just kind of go away? It's yeah, it. I have it. I have it on a VHS tape, you know, okay. like I, I've got the file somewhere, you know, but it's not, a, I never put it out online or anything. That's like a lot of the stuff I shot. I, it just never went anywhere because I was making stuff, you know, pre YouTube and, and, uh, and it just never made the you know transition to digital, I guess. Just so Did you take <clears> any, <throat> so you said uh, college or university days, did you go for filmmaking at all or what did you end up taking? That was that was the what I wanted to do, and I went to um, I ended up going to art school. And the year that I got there, the semester I started, they put they had shoved all the film cameras into a closet, and they said we're going digital. Uh, oh, and I, like yeah. I specifically asked, you know, can I just like can I just get one of those out and play with it? You know, I just you know, and they're like, nope, 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 that's all digital. And you know, they put in these uh, you know uh, computer labs, and they had a couple of uh, you know, this you know. GL twos, which was like an, it was a mini DV pre HD camera. It was a Canon, uh, you know, pretty nice camera, but, but it was like in that transition period where 
th there was like the whole thing about like, well, you know, film will never die because video looks like crap, you know, but they were trying to push in that direction, you know, <laughs> like, you know, what year was that? Um, 2000, 2001. I was going to so 28 days later, do you remember that? Yes. yes. That was yes. what the first full film? on digital yes I that think? was shot on a canon xl2 which was like three generations after the gl2 and i actually had one of those and that was kind of what i was shooting on because i was like okay well they did it you know that's sure. good that's good enough quality um and then quickly it you know as soon as the hd cameras started coming out it, it was not anymore but and um it, it's like a time capsule i mean that it suited that film for sure yeah. Like you yeah. go back and watch. I mean, we'll never have an HD copy of it simply because, or you know, it's <laughs> close to it because of what we have. But it that one you'll all, I always remember it as that grainy. It almost looked like watching a VCD or a, a Divix rip or something. You know, yeah. But that was the appeal of it. But right. I, I'm glad that they didn't shoot a whole shit ton of films because you know it'd be like Star Trek: The Next Generation, where a lot of that doesn't exist on film, and mm -hmm. they go back and try to upscale it, and you're like, ah, "Boy, that's going to be a job." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, and and actually, and another one that sort of was in the transition period, but a little later was uh, Cloverfield, the original Cloverfield. Yes, you know, it was the found footage thing. And I remember when I first, the first time I saw it, I was like, "Oh, this is terrible," you know, like, but. Uh, going back, I think it holds up better now if you go back and because I think at the time the shaky cam and the POV, you know, um, was disorienting and it just didn't make sense. But now, like everything is that way. That's what that's what's on the internet. That's like the <laughs> language of of uh, motion media now. Like it now, it just looks like normal. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, that's true. We were used to a fairly steady kind of picture in, in frame whereas it went yeah because now i mean oh my god my kids i love them to death but they're used i you know i'm kind of used to it but just get charlotte on facetime for a minute and it's you know like this and i love her but yeah they're, they're just used to the entire world moving 24 7 yeah and that's that's one of the things that i was trying to combat back then um you know like uh uh you know because there's a like the visual language of film, uh, you know, the old cameras, you know, they're like 40 pounds, the film mm -hmm. cameras. So they move like this. It's a, it's a solid, slow, methodical movement. You know, there's a weight to it, but a phone, it just twists and, and even a camcorder, you know, there's no weight. So that's one of the kind of giveaways. It makes it feel cheap and it, it just doesn't feel like a movie. It feels like a home video, at least at that time. But like I said, now it's changed and, Huh. And it's just normal that, you know, people don't really think about it that way anymore. That's true. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, especially going back, you know, I mean, early eighties and further back, you know, it was just heavy gear, I suppose at that point, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, and actually that reminds me, sorry. I'm, I'm like, no, you're good. <laughs> from the last show, um, you, you were talking about Hitchcock and there's that movie with the, the, the two that had the body in the trunk. Yes. It's called, it's called Rope. That's and, it. Oh, and it's got, uh, oh, buddy from uh, It's a Wonderful Life, right? Yeah, yeah, Jimmy Stewart. Uh, oh, so and good. It is, yeah, it's what probably my favorite Hitchcock movie. And and that's one of the things, they shot it in color, which was kind of novel at the time. And the color camera, I guess, my understanding is that it was so large, they had to have it on a track, and it kind of moved back and forth. They couldn't have a camera operator because it was this huge machine. And, um, and so it's just, it's a technical, it's very impressive, you know, as a, I guess, as a film nerd, because one of the, the gimmicks in that movie is that it was, it was one continuous shot, which wasn't actually yeah. possible at the time because uh, a film canister only lasted 20 minutes. Right. So there are all these, like, they're, if you know what you're looking for, they're not that subtle, but they have all these sort of like wipes, like where somebody will approach the camera and it goes white for a second and then they move away. And that was when they would change camp film canisters. Um, so, but it's, yeah, that's a great, great movie. Great suspense. And, uh, and it, you know, I never thought about, but having a, a fixed camera that can only move back and forth kind of adds to the claustrophobia bit of that show of that as well, because you've yeah. got, even though you've got a kitchen, uh, kind of a living room and then the back bedroom, but that's all there was. And they just kind of back and forth and you know that you can feel them just getting more and more anxious and antsy and oh yeah, yeah. if yeah. anybody hasn't seen it i'm glad thank you for remembering it's rope guys and it 
it really, I don't know. Yeah, it's maybe his best pure film. It's really good, but. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I guess uh, kind of a little aside, I just yesterday uh, finished um, a stage production of Harvey, speaking of uh, Jimmy Stewart. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. I, I was, I was uh, played Dr. Sanderson. That's actually why I cut my hair. If you ah. remember, I had uh, <laughs> long hair uh, at SRF just a couple weeks ago. Uh, yes, I like uh, Jimmy Stewart. I don't know. I know they, a lot of people accused him of overacting, but I just thought his... Uh, I, I liked his approach to it. Like, you know, his, that, uh, what do they call it? The mid Atlantic accent or whatever. He had a bit of that. So, yeah. So where did, so we got boat we're at, yeah. Digital, digital, um, video in university. Yeah. Where'd it go from there? Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So we, we shot some of this, uh, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre thing. We worked on that for a couple, I don't know, a year or two. Um, and meanwhile I was, I was, I, I got into more, well, because there was no film department, what I was in was called the new media department. Oh, which, <laughs> anyways, go ahead. Which meant, yeah, which means nothing really it, or, or anything. And that's, so I kind of, I got distracted. I ended up getting into like, uh, I was already into graphic design, but I got into like uh, more uh, interactive multimedia. I was like a flash master, uh, action script 2.0. <laughs> I never, I didn't make the jump to 3.0. But I, I made some really cool, like, interactive videos um, that, like, I, I was, I, I, they, I don't know, I had a minor, like, brush with celebrity there, you know. <laughs> it was, like, a really interesting thing where I used the action script to um, create, put this interactivity into uh, some, some videos I was making. But one of the issues is, you know, bandwidth uh, at the yeah. time like you, it was like a tiny little, you know, window and it still took, you know, 15 minutes to load. It was intended to be, you know, an online thing, but I was just kind of uh, too, I was ahead of the technology and, and I, and I would set it up like in a gallery on a little pedestal thing and, and, but people just didn't understand how to interact with it. And I just, it, it was a great concept, but it didn't really, and, and like the, the arty people understood it and were like super excited, but it didn't really translate, you know, it wasn't very accessible. So, you know, but so anyways, I guess the point is I was kind of distracted uh, on sure. some like experimental stuff and I was doing like installations and like wor working with electronics and, um, you know, more experiential stuff. And I didn't do a lot of filmmaking um, through college, aside from those like little short experimental things. But then I did a stop motion animation. That was like my senior project which was just kind of came out of nowhere, really. I was, I was just sitting in class, kind of bored one day, and I doodled um, these two ragdoll characters, um, like one of them throwing up and the piece, like, a, uh, like with a piece of cake laying there. And, and, uh, and I was like, that's funny. Uh, and I'll, I'll make an animation about this. And yeah, that was like the whole basis. And, and that's one of the ones I sent you was the uh, too much cake. Uh, Brown Bag Funnies presents episode two, Too Much Cake, in the tradition of George Lucas, making the episode uh, episode was, two before the first one. I was wondering that, yes. Yeah. And well, it was, what is it, four minutes, something like that, anyway? Yeah. Yeah. Did, uh, did the male um, raggedy guy, did he die too? Um, not, no, no. I mean, not he in didn't that. in the movie, but he, he did puke. So I was like, oh. I think maybe just a little. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, that's like, that was like a little misdirection, like he, you know, he just pukes, and then they're like, oh, no, and then, yeah, and then, well, I mean, no spoilers, or, or yeah, I get go, it, yeah. Uh, go see it, um, but, but that one actually, uh, that went to a couple festivals, and I won uh, Best uh, Visual Effects, uh, actually, I don't know if you could tell, I mean, the, you know, resolution isn't great, I was shooting on low-quality video and stuff, but I actually green-screened a lot of stuff, like the, the backgrounds in that, um, I was playing with chroma keying and stuff. Oh. So it was sort of a technical exercise as well as doing the animation. Um, like, cause it's, you know, the idea was like this infinite space, you know, but the, the floor is, is brown paper bags, like grocery bags. And um, yeah, so, you know, I couldn't really create that in. So how did you, okay. I, I figured the rest was stop motion and yeah. uh, some people are gonna be like, why are they even talking about this? But I got to ask. Yeah. So the, the vomit, what was that? Oh. And how did you do it? Okay. Yeah. So that was, a. so the whole thing I did not plan. I didn't have a script. I kind of just did it, you know, and I just kind of figured it out as I went. 
which is kind of what I, how I enjoy doing filmmaking, though it's not realistic to do larger scale projects that way. Um, but uh, it was gel wax, um, which you can, I'm sure you can still get it just at Walmart. It, you know, it's like clear and you can melt it into a candle or whatever, you know, you put like seashells in there or whatever. Um, so I, I melted down the gel wax with a little bit of clay and, and, you know, well, I think initially when the, the male character, when Raggedy Randy uh, throws up, it's sort of, it's cake colored. So mm -hmm. I actually took some of the cake, the clay from the cake and melted it into the wax to color it. And then what I did is I just stuck a, a little piece of uh, like a straight pen in the, in his face <laughs> in, where his mouth would be. And I hung the gel wax from it. And then I would just twist it a little bit. Um, uh, okay. each, each frame would twist. So it would get a little bit of a light, you know, reflection and it gave it that movement. And it just was just a straight piece of wax or of gel, you know, that would it would and I actually I think I even put little chunks of uh, of cake in there and then of course with uh, Raggedy Fran, um, it was it became colored red uh, as she continued vomiting and then and then of course it went it transitioned from being the wax to being the 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 batting the cotton and it stuff cracked me up yeah, yeah. so yeah. you're I and I absolutely I don't remember the name of the other one but your your Italian influence oh, short yeah. keepsake. You, that was really good. I know you don't need to hear that, but it was really good. Like that, especially the ending. And I mean, mm -hmm. I know it's again, what was it? Four to four to six minutes, but I just loved it. The, mm -hmm. the show playing on TV when they, was that real or did you film the, the, or did you make up the evangelical uh, pastor guy too? That was real. That was like a crazy coincidence or uh, what, what's the other thing they say? Not, I don't know. Uh, Kidman or whatever. Yeah. 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 But. Yeah. Um, so we we shot that over a weekend at a friend of mine's house. Uh, well, we had three locations. Like uh, the main was at a uh, the main interior was at, at a friend's house, and then there was uh, the exterior, like the opening, the the title sequence, which mm -hmm. actually won a, an award for it at a film festival too. Um, was at another location, and then the and then there was another interior, actually where that that was. Uh, was at another friend's house. But anyway, um, so we shot uh, for two days at the main interiors at, at the one friend's house where the, the lady gets killed and stuff. And um, and then we were going to wrap up shooting the interiors at the other place with the TV, with that on being on the TV on the Sunday morning. And I just got up at like, you know, 430 because we I was just I was like, OK, I'm going to record. I'm, I just turned on the religious channel and I was thinking, you know, maybe, maybe I'll get lucky. And, uh, that came on. I like my other plan was I was just going to have the TV like on a blue screen and I was just going to composite in something. Sure. Uh, as a backup of something. And maybe we were just going to, you know, film something ourselves or whatever, but, but that was so perfect. Um, like, yeah, I just, I actually set up my camera in my living room uh, and filmed it off the TV because I didn't have anything connected to the TV to you know, record it. Um, and then we actually just hooked the camera up to the TV at my friend's house where we shot that and played it back and just had him walk, you know, walk past it. But yeah, it like, it was so r ridiculously, uh, you know, appropriate, you know, for the whole, uh, like it had uh dawn of the dead remake vibes where uh there's if, if you've seen that one where there's there's always a tv playing in the background or they use news footage to kind of fill in the story or or, or maybe just creep the atmosphere a little bit and i, I loved it yeah. oh yeah i was i yeah. was yeah it was good and that one the the like the way that whole film came about was um my friend uh whose house we shot the tv part in uh, he is a huge horror buff. Um, and he was like, at the time he was like really into the, like the Italian, like giallo slasher kind of the, the, you know, Argento. Mario Bava. Ar yeah. Argento. Uh, it's the only and, one I know. So I got to sound smart. So yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, we watched all the crazy old like torso and, um, uh, I can't, I don't know this, you know, it was a long time ago. Zombie two. Was that one? Oh, of them? That wasn't, I mean, I, that's, that's, that's on my list. That's, yeah, okay. that's Fulci. Uh, but that's, yeah. And I think he'd be into that too, but it's, it's, it's a little bit of a different category, <laughs> but, but, uh, but absolutely, you know, that, yeah. Fighting a shark. And uh, I mean, that's classic. 
Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so there was this contest for a radio station up in Kansas City, which is is like that's one of the closer big cities to where I live, and um, it was a like make a commercial for us, and they put sound effects and like logos that you could use in your commercial, um, and I my I had this idea uh, where a guy like puts all these uh, like musical, like a microphone and a drumstick and stuff into a blender and like blends it up and then drinks it. And then he pukes it out and it like forms the logo for the radio station. And, um, and I called my friend that I knew was into this, into horror movies and stuff. And I was like, well, he's also a huge David Lynch fan. Uh, his- <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, his son's name is actually Sailor, which is uh, after the Nicolas Cage character in, in Wild at Heart. But um, and I and I said, you know, you know, I think you could be my Jack Nance, which is the guy who played Eraserhead, and uh, and that was, you know, and he was it. So um, so we shot that commercial, and then he's like, well, you know, if, if we're going to do some stuff, I've got some ideas. Let's I've got this. Uh, let's make a slasher like Giallo's thing, and so that's where Keepsake came from. It was his concept. Uh, he, we kind of co-directed it. He had no experience making anything. So I pretty much did everything, but he was like right there sort of like over my shoulder saying yes or no. And so I, and that's, you know, the type of filmmaking I did at the time was I did everything. I was the cameraman. I set up the lights. I, you know, did the sound and the, you know, um, which I did, you know, enjoy. And that's like kind of the Robert Rodriguez, you know, school of filmmaking back in the day. And he's a hero of mine. Uh, But, you know, I, I have since, you know, worked on some real shoots and, and I do appreciate and understand the value of a good crew. Uh, So let's, let's slide ahead uh, to modern day. What do you, do you want to, do you want to go through your movie list first or do you want to talk, do you want to, do you want to talk about what you got coming up? At the end, where, where would you rather do it? Um, I don't know. I I'd say, I we might. I think we might as well kind of finish up with the movie yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. All right. right. Go ahead. Tell me. Yeah. So, what are you doing right now? And what your uh, and I've got a couple questions I want to ask you from the audience too. But uh, what's your latest project you're doing right now? All right. Well, so so I basically took uh, like a. 10 to 12 year hiatus from filmmaking. And I started a, I, I, well, I got into the property business. Um, and hey, I've got, I've got a bunch of rental properties now. I also started a coffee shop. I started a farmer's market. I've, I've just been a serial entrepreneur over the last, you know, 15 years. Which, um, not to interrupt, but we'll have you back at another point to talk about all your entrepreneurial <laughs> ventures if you're up for it. So, oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, and where it's like, you know, cause I, you know, the filmmaking was a passion. It was, you know, you know, I, I love doing it, but I, I never made any money doing it. Uh, so I was like, you know, I saw some opportunities, you know, doing this stuff and, and this is, you know, actually worked for me. So now I actually stepped away from the coffee shop, uh, in December of last year. And actually the year before I had, told myself, I'm going to get back into filmmaking one way or another, you know, and, and that year, actually, I helped a fr- another friend of mine make a film kind of similar to how I'd done it before, where she had no experience. And I kind of was a consultant and, you know, helped it get made. Um, and then I just kind of kept my eyes open and, and just ha- happened to. It's okay. You know, we love animal fear. We yeah, just had that. Yeah. yeah. No worry. <laughs> um, and I started seeing these opportunities and um and now i've actually got you know uh, a budget to work with so i i have uh started entering into it from the producer side uh because also all the technology's changed you know like cameras are all different the you know the distribution's all different you know editing software everything that i knew is now different sure so i thought okay i'm just going to get on some sets i'm going to you know talk to the camera crew talk to the you know yeah, I know. Try to, you know, approach it from this direction. And then, you know, maybe in a, you know, within the next two years or so, I'll probably start producing my own stuff again. But, uh, but yeah, so I just, uh, in September, um, I, I produced my first film. Uh, we went out, out in LA, actually, we, I shot it. It was a short, uh, but it's, it's great. It's kind of a, a comedy 
silly comedy with a sci-fi twist. I, I, if you're, you know, familiar with Netflix shows, um, it's kind of like Kimmy Schmidt meets Black Mirror. Oh, wow. Like, okay. And it's great. The script is great. And it's like uh, a bunch of uh, UCB alums, like younger people that have gone through, if you know, the Upright Citizens Brigade, like school, mm -hmm. like improv school program. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, I guess I won't get too much into it, but it's, we shot the whole thing in four days and, um, and it was just awesome. You know, it was like the most professional crew I've ever worked with and, um, and well, and you know, the strikes going on. Right. So right. this being a micro budget, um, it kind of was a gray area. So we actually got like super talented people that were just needed to work. And so we, we got people that I'm sure we never would have gotten if not for the strike. That's um, really cool. I know, mean, our, it is what it is, but yeah. Yeah. Like our cinematographer, the director, like everybody was just amazing. So, so that was an awesome experience. Um, and I think it's going to be an awesome movie. I hope it, it, you know, it should be any time. I'm, I'm hoping to see a cut of it. Um, the, the editor said it'd take about a month. The producer said, yeah, you know, maybe three or four months. So we'll see. Maybe so shortly after the beginning of the year. And I mean, I get, the, what do you do with a short nowadays? Is it still just out to film festivals or? That's a good question. Yeah. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, yeah. That's, a, that was one of my questions. And I, I don't know that I got a satisfactory answer to it. <laughs> like film festivals from what I've been told um, are pretty, pretty dead these days. Like, you know, it's not really, you know, back in the old days, you'd make a movie, it'd go to festivals, you'd get hype, there'd be distributors would go there to try to find new movies to buy them and distribute them. And now everything just, I guess, just goes on onto online or, or you have to have a connection. And actually, that's one thing, you know, our producer, um, she actually worked for Netflix. Uh, so I'm hoping we might have a foot in the door there. But, um, but yeah, so and also, so there is going to be some shopping around, but I think it's going to be a little more online and, mm -hmm. um, and they, the people that wrote it are writing a feature length version. Um, so if, right. You know, that somebody... seems to, uh, one of the, um, stepping st like, uh, oh, lights out. That was one that started as a short turned into a feature mm -hmm. length. The serial killer that can't see what was his, uh, shoot um played by really good old character actor anyway that was also a short that was turned into a full like feature length so that makes sense yeah, yeah yeah okay and then you've got you kind of implied you have another horror movie coming up do you yes and this is one that i it's one of the things i'm most excited about because it's like straight out of my childhood uh and the, and the guy is a writer director um down in florida and I actually did clear with him. He said it's cool that I can talk about uh, a little more detail in this one. But it's it's a love letter to uh, 80s horror and metal because uh, he's also a musician. And I and the script is amazing and uh, it's pretty ambitious. Uh, but I think it. I'm I you know of course I'm hoping it's going to be you know the next uh, you know Blair Witch or whatever. But but it's it's kind of it's got some. Yeah, well, actually, I'm not sure how much I should say, but it's 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 just it's got some it's comedy horror. Sure. Um, it's got some it's going to have some really cool um, practical monster effects and oh, wonderful and uh, yeah yeah all practical effects. Um, that's that's part of the ambitious part. <laughs> uh, so what does a I don't know if you can get into numbers, but what does a micro budget horror film? What do they earmark for a budget for something like that nowadays? Well, I think. I think there is, it's, yeah, I think there's a technical limit to what's, you know, micro budget. And I think it's 20,000. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's, it's actually is you know, pretty small, uh, which I mean, back in the day, that would have been a lot for me, my, the films I was making, but, um, but yeah, the one we did out in LA, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. It was kept it under the micro budget level. I, I as I understand it, I, I left that up. So this is something I've learned too, because back when I was doing my filmmaking, I didn't have a producer, you know, sure. I was the producer, I guess. Uh, so I didn't really understand the, you know, technicalities of that stuff. And I guess, you know, there's like the producer, there's the executive producer, associate producers, all these levels. And um, my understanding is the producer, that's the person that like puts it together. 
the executive producers who like just basically just put some money in, you know, right. They might have some pull with, you know, the, you know, and the big names when, you know, Steven Spielberg, uh, executive produces, you know, he can bring, you know, Tom Hanks into your movie or whatever. And that's, that's the, va the value of a powerful executive producer beyond the money. Um, but, uh, I can't remember why I brought that up, but <laughs> we're just talking about budgets. That's all. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh yeah. But um, yeah. So, um, I mean, I think I've heard people say anything under ten million is considered low budget now. Oh, that's fair. Yeah, uh, totally. I get that because yeah. I mean, and there's I I, I man. I could go a thousand ways with this conversation with you. That's why I brought him on, guys, is because sometimes I don't have time to talk to people I consider friends at events, and so we can do it live here so you can enjoy it. But the middle, the middle budget, the medium budget films are completely disappeared now, too. Yeah, but yeah, and that's something. Um, well, I think I think I well, I don't even know anymore. Like I was going to say, I think that's kind of what Blumhouse was doing. Yes, yeah. they were. You know. I don't know, but they were probably spending 30 million or, or you know, I, I mean, those paranormal activity movies didn't cost much. Was that Blumhouse? Or is that? No, that's James Wan. Okay. That, yeah, he was his own. I totally. I can't remember what the name of his is, but yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, absolutely. Yeah. Cause the people in the, so uh, CJ, this is Christopher. He said 20 K is insanely small. Yes. Cause yes. wasn't clerks made for around. No, it was more than that even, wasn't it, in the 90s? Kevin Smith's Clerks? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. Um, what did he – because he yeah, – I think he – I forget. It was credit cards for him too, but it was – it was. I want to say maybe thirty or 40000 maybe. I can't remember. I think it was and something like that. Blair Witch was what, fifty or a hundred? No, was it – I don't know. It doesn't – I'll look it up and I'll, I'll be completely wrong. But CJ says $10 million sounds more reasonable for low budget. And yeah. that's what I love about horror – is that it? They're some of the only films making bank right now because they're coming out with ten and twenty million dollar budgets. And then when um, this one that was made by a, um an Australian YouTuber, The Hand. It's not called The Hand, but uh, Becky oh, and I went and talked to me. Talk to me. Such a good film, and it was made for two million dollars, I think. Wow. So Man. yeah, they and they they filmed the yeah. Speaking of Robert Rodriguez, here you go. El Mariachi. I was going to see if anybody met and even knew that film. So, yeah. yeah. And that's, yeah. And like I said, you know, Robert Rodriguez, I've, you know, seen all those movies. I've watched all the, you know, commentary tracks and the one minute film school and read his book. And, you know, that was. I'm going to ask you this. I, do. I don't know if anybody else has. Okay. Have you ever seen Four Rooms? Yes. Okay, good. I was so glad nobody else has ever seen it. It's one of my favorites. I, yeah, yeah it's got, I mean, a Tarantino and a Robert Gregg Regress film. And I can't remember the other two directors, but the entire, oh, see, Jeremy's seen it too. That makes me happy. But it yeah. is, there were so many good films in the 90s, man, that were just, yeah. Yeah. And that was, and, you know, of course, Tarantino and Rodriguez have collaborated. You know, that was, I think that was their first collaboration. And of course, they did Grindhouse and, uh, with they Planet did, Terror and they did um, the the vampire movie might have been before that. I thought, yeah, I wasn't sure from Dust Till Dawn. Right? Yes, Dust Till Dawn. That yeah, they would have been very close. So, yeah, and yeah, which I love that too. I love the the uh, genre shift in there, you know. Um, but actually, and that's sort of you know my you know my master plan, uh, my kind of you know my delusion of grandeur is to the Robert Rodriguez kind of, he basically created his own film industry, you know, in Austin, you know, right. Like mm -hmm. he, uh, my understanding is he still, you know, produces and mixes his, his own music in his garage loft and like does a lot of his own effects and green screens and stuff. And uh, outside of the studio system, outside of the, you know, the unions and, and um, you know, and that's kind of, that's, that's been like kind of my fantasy that, you know, kind of got derailed when I went off to make money. But uh, I, uh, you know, I'm hopefully going to try to do. It. And another one is uh, Peter Jackson. You know, same sure. same sort of thing. You know, just in. Uh, Nobody the, thinks of him as a um, uh, over the top uh, <laughs> horror guy, but that's where he um, he got his start with. Uh, oh man, yeah. I'm having a rough night for remember movies. But the one has two different titles, and yeah. it's the one that had the record for the most blood. Yep, Dead Alive or Brain Dead. Thank you. Out. There. See, I, I'll just bring up these random facts and you can fill in the uh, pertinent information there for me. <laughs> yeah. 
And even before that, he did one called Bad Taste that was, um, that was like his Evil Dead. You know, it took him five years to make it, I think. And it's actually really good. I mean, you could tell he's a visionary, you know, from the very beginning. And it has like amazing gore and just gross out stuff. And and it's just, I don't know, it's worth look trying to find if you can. Bad Taste. Another one for you before we'll move on. I got to get to your list next, but oh, yeah, you ever yeah. see the film Curdle? Um, so yeah, is um, that the one with the lady? It was a character from, from fiction, yes. and she yeah, cleans yeah. up, yeah, yeah. No, I don't. You mention it, and people are like, Does that really exist? But yeah, she was a crime scene cleaner and she was obsessed with what was it decapitated heads talking or whatever. It's a great movie, and I, yeah. I'm pretty sure Tarantino produced it or had a hand into it but it's not not listed on his films you know so yeah yeah i miss you know there was a lot of interesting stuff in the 90s like the all the independent stuff like stuff like well another one kind of like that was um perdita durango very obscure i i don't i hardly know hardly anybody has heard of it but it um and it's a it's one of the side characters from uh wild at heart um, really? I, I think she was, I can't even remember which character it was. I think she was like, a an assassin or something in that movie that was trying to hunt down Nicolas Cage's character. And, uh, and it's a, it is a crazy, uh, surreal, violent, uh, <laughs> thing. All right. I got two questions from the audience. Let's see if we can do them each in about a minute. Cause I want to give you like, as long as we can for your list, because you got yeah. a good list. I know you do. So, all right, we got two. First one, what is your opinion on remastering old films? Hmm. Oh, I, I think it, uh, well, I mean, I guess, okay. I'll try to keep this short. Um, I, I, <laughs> I don't have any necessary, well, okay. If it's a George Lucas, uh, re-edit, uh, on it's like, yeah, like I don't, I don't really like, uh, you know, changing, plot points and but i don't mind sprucing up the effects or sound effects or something like that i you know but you know like that's something uh you know i guess you know disney plus has been doing like going back and like inserting stuff and and, and netflix and some of these streaming stuff and it's like it's like i don't know i feel like it's kind of like it's cheating you know they're changing history you know but uh yeah i'm not totally in favor of it i think uh yeah Right. rebooting films i think is almost always a bad idea if that's pretty it. rare my <laughs> film professor in university said he goes you know why are they always taking good films and remaking them why don't they go back and take shitty films and try to remake them into a better film it's like okay, yes. I'll give you that. yeah well like like uh uh the crazies by george romero like i wouldn't yes. say it's a shitty film but it's not one of his best but the premise i thought it was great and they remade it oh, 15 yeah. years ago whatever and I remember reading an interview with the guy that was remaking it. And I always thought, you know, like, what's the scariest thing? Well, you know, I thought the uh, the the martial law crackdown, uh, you know, like that was like the that was the uh, element that I thought could have been explored for like some interesting, you know, unique horror. But and that's what the director was saying that he was going to be doing in the remake. But it just ended up being a dumb zombie movie instead, you know, and it's like, well. I'm sure the studio got involved. In it, and I'm actually kind of partial to the remake. I do like it. Yeah. But yeah. only because it kind of stands on its own. I, and I, I watched it before I knew it was a remake of an old one, which happens quite often, you know. And I, I might have been overly critical because I was, I was a huge Romero nerd, you know, so oh, I probably I, should go back and see it again. It was, I enjoy it. And to be honest, I like some of the um, the Wes Craven remakes too, or or. I guess the, the maybe not just Wes Craven, but the exploitation movies like I Spit on Your Grave and Last Toast on the Left. Those oh, remakes, yeah. even um, Hills Have Eyes remakes, I was kind of was like, yeah, I'll take it, you know. But yeah. I didn't grow up on '70s horror either, right? So I these were my first exposure to them were the early 2000s, and so like oh, I kind of dug them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, and yeah, and I do have some of that. I you know, I'm a little bit of a purist on some like. You know, you guys talked about fast zombies, and I'm not a fast zombie guy. <laughs> I do, I did enjoy 30, uh, 28 Days Later, but they were rage monsters, not zombies. I knew somebody uh, would bust my balls. I was waiting for somebody to say, you know, <laughs> I'm that kind of nerd, you know, it's Frankenstein's monster. Yes, it's not Frankenstein. Yeah. Um, and this one, I don't know if you know, but I thought we'd add uh, Kodak stopped making film because of the silver costs. 
or was there more involved in that? Or uh, I'm not sure. I'm not. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if that's part of it. I, I think, I think the film industry kind of just moved away from film because it was so much cheaper sure. uh, and so much quicker, you know, like you could shoot and watch everything. You didn't have to send it off to be developed. You didn't have to get a print back. Editing was quicker and cheaper. You know, like that was like Kevin Smith, like clerks, I bet probably 75% of his budget went to just film. Oh, 100%. You know, just, yeah. Like and I mean, he could have made that movie for 3000 bucks. <laughs> black and white, but still, I mean, but like you said, now dailies are instant. You know, there's none of this send it away to get it developed and then, you know, let, let the executives watch your dailies that night. It's no, you can pretty much, I assume it's all just uploaded to the cloud at this point anyway. So, yeah. Well, the shoot that I did, you know, in LA, uh, you know, last month or whatever. Yeah, I guess. Uh, the editor was on the set and he was editing like while we were shooting. You know, oh like, goodness, that's so weird. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's get to your list, Will. So we're an hour in already. So you guys know we're in for a night. And as long as you're good to go, I'm good for, <laughs> yeah, we can we can go for another hour if you're up for it. So All depending right. on where your list is at, and we'll see where we go. So All right, let me get this. Now, I'm going to warn you, folks, I'm going to guess that there are going to be some obscure ones on here, and I'm going to learn some good horror films from you as well, because I, I, I've dabbled a bit in some of the obscure, but maybe not, I uh, haven't, you know, I, I definitely am not um, a connoisseur of the video nasties from the 80s, from, you know, that kind of stuff, and if nobody, if you don't know what the video nasties were, look it up, but it was a, a thing that uh, Britain in uh, implemented back in the day, so. Right. Yeah, and I don't know, I haven't gone down that rabbit hole. Like I have weird, like I, I've seen a lot of like really strange, obscure stuff, but I also have like gaping holes in my filmography, you know, or uh, resume or whatever, whatever you want to say. I like, I've never seen Gone with the Wind. I've never seen, I've never seen, like speaking to Jimmy Stewart, I've never seen It's a Wonderful Life. Like, wow. like uh, I just, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's weird. That's okay. <laughs> What, you know, what, I'm going to ask you right now. What's your favorite film of all time? Let's get that out of the way. Oh, geez, I never know what to say. It's always, um, you know, it kind of depends on my mood, I guess. Like, uh, I, I'd say at one point, I would, I would have said uh, Richard Linklater's Slacker, just because oh, yeah. I loved the way it came together, and I was obsessed with that for a while. I had his like uh, the script. Uh, uh, what are they? They made like a picture book with the yeah. script in it and kind of a production diary. And I just thought that was so amazing. Um, I love like, like Rushmore, uh, the yeah. uh, Wes Anderson, you know, I just, I think that's like, uh, uh, like a fairly perfect movie. Um, and, and just, you know, probably for like nostalgia purposes, the, the original Chainsaw Massacre, you know, yeah, I don't know. I'm just kind of all over the place. I, oh, I just love everything. <laughs> all right, <laughs> go ahead. Honest. Get into your list. Where are we at here? Okay, so um, I'll just start at the top. And we've already touched on several of these. Um, but I had the first one that came to mind was Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And, and, um, and the second one, which I mentioned being one of my first uh, memories of, of film. Uh, actually, I went and saw... The t second one uh, with Joe Bob Briggs, uh, he came to the Alamo Draft House in Kansas City a few years ago and went up there and met him and and took in a screening of that on the big screen. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> he's a cool dude. I mean, I obviously have never met him. I'd love to interview him, but he's not not getting any younger. No. Yeah, he definitely it was a long day for him. I got the impression he wasn't too talkative after the movie, you know, but uh, but he's another one. You know, I've read a couple of his books and I'm a big fan. I used to watch monster vision and even pre monster vision when it was on the, the movie channel, I think he had a show mm -hmm. just called Joe Bob's drive in. I think it was even better, but anyway, um, and then, uh, let's I'll just keep moving along. Uh, sure. well, so Peter Jackson, we talked about Peter Jackson. So bad taste, uh, dead alive, but also I think, uh, one that people kind of, I don't know why. I, I guess I think I know why. It was, it was probably too dark for a general audience, but uh, the Frighteners gets oh, overlooked a lot. Really, and because that was a huge. It, I remember it was put out. It was uh, promoted everywhere, and that was mm -hmm. Michael J. Fox, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you like you're that's one of yours. You enjoy that one? Oh yeah, I, I yeah I just um, well and Jeffrey Combs too. We we talked a little bit about uh, Reanimator. I think before we started yes. recording, and and actually I yeah that he's another one I. 
uh, you know, met him at a, a film festival. He they did a screening of Reanimator, and he was there talking about it. And and yeah, he's just a <laughs> he's so he's such a great actor. He's so fun. Um, but but yeah, I just that's just such a crazy cool movie. And, and it's just and also I just love the seeing the development of the filmmaker. You know, um, just I love that story of Peter Jackson just with his yeah. friends doing the super low budget thing. And just kind of, you just see him like progress and the ideas and, and the technology, because, you know, of course, Weta, his, his product, his uh, effects studio is one of the best, biggest in the world too. And um, I, I really enjoy his documentary stuff now. I actually, mm. cause he, you know, I mean, whatever you want to think, but the, I would not call uh, the Hobbit movies classics. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, um, the world war one colorized film that he did. Um, have you seen that? It the footage from World War One, and then they colorized it using his technology. So huh. good. Uh, I'll look up the title while you're uh, giving the next bit of your list. And then yeah. he just recently did one on the Beatles, which I haven't seen yet, but I want to see that. Yeah, that I was very close to watching that, but I, I still haven't got to it yet. So what do you got uh, next for us? Okay, well, kind of similar uh, is is Evil Dead slash Sam Raimi. Uh you know, you know, exactly another another example of that. You know, independent filmmaker just having fun with his friends and and just uh, you know finding that finding success and 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 of course and again uh, you know uh, Bruce Campbell, you know he's just I love him. Yeah, yeah, he's and he's a gen, uh, he's another guy. I met him at a, like a book signing thing, and and he took a moment out. You know, he waited. It was like three hours after the event. He wait. You know, took a couple minutes with every single person to chat. You know, and like, uh, just you know, I mean, he's yeah, just a cool guy. Just as genuinely charismatic, and uh, you know, seems like a great guy. But but also with Sam Raimi, um, you guys mentioned Drag Me to Hell in that last mm. episode, but I don't think anybody mentioned. I'm pretty sure that's a Sam Raimi movie it was kind of his return to like actual horror after doing Spider-Man and all that. Which stuff. is so weird that uh, <laughs> yeah. evil dead does Spider-Man. I completely, when he was doing it, I completely glossed over it. Then I went back. I'm like, Holy shit. That's evil dead. Just Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, and you can, if you go back to like evil dead Two, you know, there's some like really cool, like camera movements and stuff. He, he just has this, and he did it a little bit in that, uh, uh, the, the, what was it? The, Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, um, Marvel movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. The the. Oh my God! What a night! I want to say uh, something in time. It was called, but it's Doctor yeah. Strange. There we go. Yeah, yeah. The multiverse something of madness. madness. Yeah, yeah. We, and it's and I, you know, I, I was overall, I was kind of, I was pretty disappointed in that because they said, oh, it's the first actual horror movie in the Marvel U cinematic universe, and it's like, no, no, really. it wasn't. <laughs> but. But, uh, um, oh, I had another thing about Sam Raimi, but I think I, oh, oh, and also, I guess, and on the other hand, you can go back, and he also made Dark Man, which is, I think it holds up pretty well. I saw some of it uh, a couple of years ago when I was a kid. I thought it was cool, but you can, you can see that, uh, you know, a straight line from that to Spider-Man, too. Because <clears throat> Dark Man was, how does the story go? He wanted to get the rights to do a superhero film, I think, and he couldn't, or because Darkman was an original property, wasn't it? I think so. There's a story behind that, and I oh man, anyway, hmm. it he so whatever the original, I wish I could find it, whatever the original comic book, it might have been a comic book from the 60s or 50s that he wanted to get the rights to do. And he couldn't, so he made Dark Man, which was basically a, a knockoff of it. So there's a YouTube channel, Red Letter Media. They do deep dives into old films sometimes called Review, and they did that one. So yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah carry well, on. Which I could totally see because, you know, before Evil Dead, they did a short called Into the Woods, I think, or... That was basically, you know, uh, something to try to raise the funds to make the feature. So I think Dark Man was him, like saying, "Look, I can do this. You know, I can make a, a superhero movie." Absolutely. And it, money. Yeah, and they, from what I've heard, it holds up really well. I haven't watched it in years, but I, I should again. But again, yeah. there's so many we could watch. Yeah. Okay. And then, so this is my first uh, kind of curveball. <laughs> uh, 
uh, and it, I don't really recommend anyone watch it, but uh, I had to put it on my list because it's significant to me. Uh, it was is Blood Sucking Freaks. Um, hmm. It is a trauma movie. Oh, here we go. All right, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it was produced by them, but it was, uh, I can't, I think the, I can't remember the director. It may be like Russ Meyer or something, but it is, it's just depraved. It's a, uh, but the, the reason it's significant to me. So that friend of mine that I mentioned that, uh, was kind of sheltered. This is one I bought this. I just saw this at a pawn shop and bought the VHS when I was in high school, didn't know anything about it. And it was like, it's like, it's definitely one of the worst movies ever made, like in every, every sense of, of the, uh, you know, it's like, it's poorly made, but also just subject matter wise, there's like almost no redeeming qualities. So, um, so we loved it. We watched it a bunch of times and uh, we actually named our band after there's a, like a dwarf. He's like the Igor character in the, in this movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, his name is Ralphus. And that was the name of my band. We named it after, after him. We have at least one fan, Loco, Mike, the Filipino nomad, says Blood Sucking Freaks is a good one. All that right. Makes me happy. There you go. Nice. And I don't know if you can see it, but I've got the I got the movie poster, the cover art up here on the screen right now for people in case they want to get a taste of what it is. <laughs> yeah. There's very little actual blood sucking in the movie also, uh, just so, to be warned. There's some brain sucking. Through Trauma straw. films were, uh, yeah, anyway. They're, they're yeah. their whole, whole own genre. So you're right. Well, yeah, and Lloyd Kaufman, the whole trauma, uh, uh, Toxic Avenger, like that. That also is you know part of my childhood. <laughs> uh, what? Oh, Class of Newcomb High. You know. Yeah. Um, okay, and then okay, uh, Romero, Dawn of the Dead. We kind of well, Dawn of the Dead in particular, of course, Night of the Living Dead. Uh, but I, the original Dawn of the Dead is that was probably my favorite film when I was in high school. Um, and, and again, I probably need to go back and watch the, the remake. Um, I was never a big Zack Snyder guy, uh, and the fast zombies. And I, I think I pretty much just d dismissed it. I did watch it, but I think I just grumbled through the whole thing because I was, you know, being I can picture that. You know, jerk. <laughs> I don't know it. Oh, frig. I, I just love it. It's one of my all time favorites. I, but again, I don't particularly care for the original. Now, the original Night of the Living Dead, I think, is probably one of the best horror films ever made. It's just such yeah. a perfect, you know, I put that right up on the shelf with a couple of Hitchcock films for sure. But yeah. I just, I love, I don't know, it was just a perfect time for that Dawn of the Dead remake. You know, there was yeah. the, three, the three fast zombie films there, or everything came out at once. And yeah, but I get yeah. you, totally. Oh, yeah. Well, and I think that was part of it, too. I kind of felt like, ah, man, it's oversaturating, you know. Uh, but, um, but yeah, and actually... Uh, well, and Don, and again, I, I don't know. I I, uh, I saw Ken Forey at a at a. Uh, I used to go to this uh, horror film festival down in Phoenix, Ooh. and uh, it was amazing. It was. Uh, I, I wish they folded it into the Phoenix Film Festival, so it doesn't exist as its oh. own thing anymore. Now they just show like a couple horror movies each night over the course of like two weeks, but this was like a four day just horror and sci fi. You know, twelve hours a day maybe 14 hours a day. It was like crazy. It was, and yeah, like that's where Jeffrey Combs was there. Ken Foree came in. Uh, oh, geez. The exorcist, the, the, the girl. Uh, oh the, yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, um, I know she was in the, I think she's in the, the newest remake that I haven't seen yet. That's what I heard. She makes a little cameo, but anyway, yeah. I mean, Romero, I love him. Uh, Dawn of the dead, uh, day of the dead, even again, okay. you know, that's, you know, I appreciate it. I, I like, I, you know, you can see what he was trying to do. Um, but then I think I, or maybe it was pre-recording Return of the Living Dead, which is not actually a right. Romero, you know, uh, it just, and I mean, this is one that we would rent when I was a small child, <laughs> five years yeah, old, it would be. because it has, it has humor in it. And it's, it's got the, you know, like the, the half, I mean, I don't know how familiar how much you you, know, you remember it, but there's so, the the effects were so crazy, you know, like the the half woman with the the tailbone flopping on the table, like yes. um, acid and, rain. Yes, yeah, the punks, the the like, just I don't know. I and there's a really good uh, documentary about that. And uh, I want to say, what's the guy, Dan? Dan O'Bannon. 
Dan O'Bannon. That's exactly who it is. And they were, yeah. wasn't he, didn't he have something to do with the original uh, Night of the Living Dead? Weren't they like, I don't know. Any, maybe not, maybe not anyway, but there was, there's some tie into that. There's, oh, anyway, that's a whole nother documentary for a whole nother <laughs> evening. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. And it, it, there it's on, there's one on YouTube. I watched it years ago about the production. Cause it was a troubled production. You know, is they were trying to, uh, I think it was pretty low budget and kind of rough working, uh, conditions and, but, uh, yeah, but yeah, that's a great one. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, uh, okay. Okay. okay now. Okay. So you guys veered into, uh, one of my favorite uh, horror subgenres, uh, the psychological horror, um, and but one film in in that last show. Ooh. But I uh, I didn't hear anybody mention Jacob's Ladder, which is just one of it just I feel like it's a great film, just in general, like outside even you know the horror genre. Um, are you familiar? <laughs> I am, and oh. again, it's one that slipped through my through my fingers. But a ton of people whom I respect hype it up quite quite a bit. So I think I need to go back and watch it. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I would say so. It's a, uh, you know, I mean, you don't want to give it away or anything, but uh, but yeah, it is. Um, I don't know. It's just a very powerful movie, and just it's like um, I don't even know what to compare it to. But I, it's one thing. I just love it when somebody can successfully do that. Um, yeah, uh, you know the the unreliable narrator. You know he's seeing things you don't know if they're there, and you know they bring in the psychological, the uh, the supernatural elements, and and uh, yeah, and like it's, Fight Club, for instance, in a sense. Yeah, Would yeah, you could say that. Yeah. Narrator? Yep. yeah, you could say that. But it's you know it's his sanity unraveling, and and you know demons, and and uh, and I guess just to stay on that sort of a vibe. Um, I had something else written here. Oh, oh, uh, in the mouth of madness, I think is another. That's a John Carpenter film that kind of gets overlooked Ooh. a lot of times, with Sam Neill, who I, I also within the Sam Neill vein, uh, Event Horizon is another one that I feel like deserves more love. <laughs> yes, uh, I saw that on VHS <laughs> back in the day in my friend's living room, and we loved it. And I don't think yeah. I've revisited since, but it it's starting to get. A bit of a cult following 25 years later so i don't know it's weird yeah yeah but it's it's got some of the kind of psychological stuff but also just kind of horrific the imagery the you know production design is amazing on that and, but uh but yeah the mouth of madness madness if you haven't seen that i would say you know push that up on your list it's it's got that kind of john carpenter i don't know you know he's got that that magic it's like you can tell it's like cheap <laughs> but yep. it's but that's like part of the, the the fun of it, you know, like that's the aesthetic. And uh it's and it's got kind of a Lovecraftian um yeah, like uh I I it's I don't does know. He do it's the just, soundtrack for it as well. I'm sure he does. Okay, because yeah. that's first I just I love his stuff. I know it's so cheesy. I just yeah, there's something about that kind of synthesizer. I don't know which anyway, I just love, especially his Halloween stuff was just so good. Yeah. He, yeah. And I think the, yeah, it's been a long time since I've seen it, but it, um, it's like this author that he's, he's got this uh, character that um, I guess it almost, it has some similarities to the dark half, but it's a lot better okay. um, where the characters, sort the, 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 the book world and the real world start sort of blending, you know? And so it has some Stephen King kind of, tendencies as well anytime yeah. you're dealing with an author <laughs> you almost have to yeah this yes day. yes and actually yeah speaking of stephen king uh i don't i don't know if i i enjoyed your conversation about him because of course i grew up uh, we watched the it miniseries we taped it you know that was yes. like one of our regular watches <laughs> taped it off the tv and, and how about i gotta ask how about 1994 the stand did you watch that um it came out? i think i i missed part of it i watched i know i watched the first installment um but i don't think i ever finished it oh, so good i yeah. love it i will watch it once a year it's like six hours with the commercials cut out and becky and i will watch it i mean i was so disappointed with the uh the hbo 
the stand anyway but yeah, uh, yeah. so i will watch it's worth watching once yeah i wanted to i wanted to catch that the the remake i was because i that's a great story you know i really enjoy you know that uh the premise well and also like the dark tower which isn't necessarily horror but if, have you ever read the dark tower books i've i two summers ago so i've got a shout out if he's listening mike leonid leonidas or leos on tele on uh, oh. Uh, not Telegram, but uh, Zello. Anyway, we've been buddies for a few years over there, and he's a D and D guy and stuff. And he he convinced me to start into the Dark Tower because I'm not a fantasy guy, and I managed to get into the third book, and I kind of liked it, but I just yeah, I it's just man, I don't know. I love sci-fi, I love horror. You'd think I'd love fantasy, and I just can't do it. I, I don't know. Yeah, I would say. I, yeah, I guess I didn't even really think of it as much uh, as fantasy. So, much. so did you just start on the third book, or you've you've read the first three? I think, yeah, I, no, no, I I made it through. It was the summer I was siding the house, and I got through the first two books, and then I think okay. I petered out. Yeah. I, I have this um, personal philosophy that life's too short to enjoy books or to to endure books you don't enjoy. So, yeah, on I, I move. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. And I think the fifth book uh, is called Wizard and Glass. And it's that was almost too much for me, I think. <laughs> I think I actually stopped reading it and then I came back to it later. But I don't know. I, I It ties in a lot of the you know other elements, in particular, the stand that plays like a pretty sure. you know, big part of uh, you know their dimension hopping. But um, uh, OK, let's see here. Uh, Cronenberg, um, you guys mentioned body horror. You mentioned The Fly. Yes. Um, and I'm I love that stuff, you know. But probably my favorite of his because it also has that psychological, uh, um, unreliable narrator thing that is Videodrome. Um, oh, I've never watched, but so you know he's Canadian, right? Yes. Or at least yes, which is cool because mm -hmm. we don't have that many great directors, so. Um, have you seen, he didn't direct this, but he actually acted in it. Have hmm. you seen last night or the last night? Hmm. No. And if you think. haven't, it's worth finding. Uh, I think I found it on YouTube for free. It's a, an apocalyptic film. It was Canadian. It's got Sandra O oh and a bunch of other kind of semi recognizable Canadian actors, but there's an unnamed thing happening to the sun and the entire premise is what would you do with your life if you had 24 hours to live because the world's going to be and anyway he he's in it he acts all the way through it and it's kind of interesting i didn't realize it was him till almost the end so it's worth watching if you get a chance yeah interesting yeah that's always fun he uh, he i think he usually has some kind of a little cameo in most of his stuff like uh but uh but yeah yeah videodrome is um the premise if you it's uh well james woods Mm -hmm. is the, the main character in, in all his psychotic glory. He, he's, he's pretty, he's pretty intense in this, in that one. And Debbie Harry, interestingly enough, is sort of, is the female lead. Really? Blondie. Blondie. Yeah. Did not know that. Okay. Might be worth watching. Yeah. And, um, and he is a, uh, like a TV producer guy, uh, like on kind of a, I guess I'm not sure what it would be. It's like a, a regional network kind of station and they have, um, and he does like the late night programming and he's all about like pushing the violence, pushing the sex, you know, he's like, you know, this is, you know, and he's super into it. And, and um, he taps into this uh, like pirate signal and it's apparently showing like actual like snuff films or something. And, and, uh, and he's like, this is the next thing we got to show this, you know? And, uh, but it, and then it, it goes into, there's this cult of the TV thing. And it's like, uh, there's a, uh, it's like, I don't know, there's uh, body horror enters into it. It, it, it's like, huh. it's, it's just crazy. It's, it actually has some kind of similar, um, like they live elements like they yeah. they would actually be kind of a good um uh, double, double bill feature. Double feature yeah, yeah. okay but i got to watch it now you i think you've sold me on it it sounds like my yeah. type of thing so yeah it's very it's very dark it's pretty bleak you know it's not a it's not a fun time movie but it's a it's a good watch i grew up in the 90s there there wasn't <laughs> such, there wasn't too many happy endings in those films yeah and then another cronenberg movie that i feel like 
kind of it, it was his first feature uh it's called shivers and oh, i've heard about it but never seen it yeah i think that's worth watching too and it's kind of a it's this high rise uh kind of all in one apartment complex building um and this uh kind of parasite thing starts affect infecting people and turning them into like sex zombies <laughs> <laughs> There's not as much sex. It's like it's more violent than sexy, but they, they, um, but it's definitely you know. I mean, that's kind of a Cronenberg thing too, right? Sure. There's like, um, and and yeah, you know, of course, uh, I don't know. There, yeah, you have to see it. It's <laughs> like most of his, his his films have to be experienced. Yes, yes, yes. But I I feel like that's a good one. I I uh, and then of course the fly. That's it's great. That that. I actually did a podcast a couple of years ago with my cousin. He does like a, a show that where they, uh, you watch like a, a movie and then the, a panel of people come up with like a sequel. Oh. Um, and we did the fly, even though it has a sequel, we, we all made alternative sequels to it. I guess that's the idea. It's, it's for movies that got sequels that weren't very good, I guess was the idea was to try to make a better sequel. Okay. And so I watched that not too long ago and I was I was really impressed how well it it held up. It's Do you want to plug his podcast? Is he still doing it? I'm not sure if he is. I I I think he is. Um it's called The Countdown Showdown, I think. Okay. Uh I'm pretty sure it's something like that. Right. We'll look it up. I'll, if if we remember, I'll throw the I'll throw it in the, in the notes after and if we don't, well, we tried. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, um, let's see here. Okay. So I'll go ahead and we, I think we touched on phantasm. I can't remember if it was pre-show or not. Yep. Um, which you, you kind of came up, uh, in the, the show before. And that's, that's again, uh, you know, I think in terms of directors and kind of like arcs of, uh, <laughs> like, I don't know, the, just the whole story, even outside of the film, I guess is I'm the same way with music. It's like I can't just enjoy an album. I've got to like be like, oh, this guy played guitar with these guys, and he wrote this album. And mm -hmm. They used to do rock, and now they're you know whatever. But um, like this, the 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 writer director Don Coscarelli, um, you know, he cre it's he created this. It's pretty amazing because it is. It's a super. It's a low budget, um, very independent, you know, production, and he has managed to kind of create this cult universe. You know, like I, I and I kind of. I'm not even sure how many movies there were, but I remember in the like late nineties catching probably number four, number five, you know, on cable and just being like, how did they get from the tall man in the mausoleum to the whole world has been like consumed in, into this other dimension? Like, it's like, it's amazingly ambitious. Like it's very, it's, I just love, you know, that he's been able to <laughs> make a career of that. Uh, but he's also done, uh, Bubba Hotep was one of his. Oh, wow. Yes. Speaking of Bruce Campbell. Yep. Plays uh, Elvis in that. Yeah. And that's a great one if anybody hasn't seen. I mean, it's very unusual, but it's it's pretty, uh, it's a fun one. And then there was another one called John Dies at the End that he directed. That That's I, more yeah. recent, isn't it? Yeah. That was uh, within the last 10 years, I would say. Yeah. I, I've seen it. I don't remember it, but I've seen it. <laughs> Yeah, it was all kind of twisty, and um, I can't. It was based on a on a book, I think, or a, a collection of short stories or something. And um, yeah, I thought it was fun. Um, like it, just kind of unexpected, you know. It was kind of refreshing. Uh, and I actually associate that because I think a friend of mine gave me a DVD of that same time they gave me a, a DVD of a movie called Pontypool. <sighs> so good! It's one of yeah. my all time favorites. I, yes, it's also Canadian. Yeah. Oh, I, I have that's been on my it's a zombie movie that doesn't really show zombies, right? Or almost right. doesn't show them. Yeah, well, and that's okay, and I, I'm hoping I'm not confusing this, but it's the one where they're in a radio station. Hundred percent, yep. Yeah, and, and the, the thing is that the it's a mind virus that's transmitted like through the airwaves or something. <laughs> I I don't remember how it's transmitted. I just remember that he keeps getting Report. So what I love about it is the entire story is told through 
like the third person narrative, you know, it'll be like the, the guy on the ground or the, the guy in the, the helicopter in the sky, you know, and, and you're hearing it. So it's a way to do a really cheap budget film, but have a really big scope. And yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. It's yeah. Loved it. That's one of my yeah. old favorites. The guy has a perfect voice for radio. Oh yeah. Yeah. So good. Yeah. And right. And that, and that's one thing I love about it too, is like the craft of it, you know, cause there's a way you can get production value out without spending a lot of money, or you can, you can create that scope, you know, if you just do it smart, you know, the way you shoot it and the, you know, and just sort of, which I guess that kind of maybe, or I was just, yeah. So uh, 28 days later, one of the best mm. scenes in the movie doesn't actually get shown. It's when he's mm. telling the story about how he's separated from his parents and he climbs on top of a pop machine and the zombies surge in. It's never filmed, but he tells this story about how it happened and to me it was a way to create this massive scene that never actually happened and i still picture it in my head same Absolutely. type of thing i always love that in film when they can get away with it yeah oh yeah well and classically i mean uh jaws you know that was one of the things you know they always talk about the shark kept breaking down they had initially planned to show it eating people and it you know but it didn't work so they just had it made it more suspenseful it probably made it a better film oh for um, sure and then uh, another, you know, kind of textbook example is Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the meat hook. Uh, when Leatherface goes to put Pam on the meat hook, um, the it's edited. You you see the hook. You see a front shot of him approaching. You know, you see it behind her, him walking toward it. He lifts her up. Um, it it's all you know reverse shots. You don't actually see it, but there's a sound effect. There's no <laughs> blood. You know. And it's, but you, you see it in your mind. Like everybody thinks they saw that hook, like penetrate sure. her back, but it's not there. You know, it's, yeah, it's just, yeah, I love that stuff. That's, it's just genius. Well, and that's, I mean, that's kind of Hitchcockian too, you know, um, uh, and, and he probably just did it for budgetary reasons, you know, like, cause they probably couldn't afford a prosthetic or whatever. And, but it, yeah, again, it just, it just better. hundred percent. Um, okay. And then, okay. So here's, um, a director that I'm a big fan of and, and it's more contemporary and actually an actor I'm a big fan of, mm. um, the it's, and the movie in particular that introduced me to both of them is called murder party. Have you ever heard of it? I don't know if I have maybe, uh, Fill it, me in. uh, let's see. I believe, I think I'd say it came out in about 2017. Uh, no, no, no. 2000. Was it 17? No, no. Oh, no. 2007. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm getting my decades. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. 2007, 2006, 2008, somewhere in there. Um, it's this guy, Jeremy Saulnier, I think is how you say his name, or Saulnier. I don't know. Um, he has since done, he did a movie called Blue Ruin, uh, another one called Green Room, and then another one that was a Seen Netflix it. movie. Yeah, Green Room. With the the punks and the green room was on my top, top film list of the year. I think it was like 2015 or something. They had Anton yes. Anton Yelchin there before he yeah. passed away. Isn't Patrick it? Stewart. That's oh, exactly. such a good film. Anyway, yeah. yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so Jeremy Saulnier, he's the I believe writer director on all those. And Murder Party was his first feature, and um, and he had kind of has his you know, stable of actors. Well, so, and kind of his main guy appears to be this guy, um, Macon Blair, who is, he's like one of my favorite actors like right now. Uh, and, but he's just not, you know, he hasn't really broken that big, but um, uh, he plays, uh, so Murder Party, the premise I love because I had been to art school and the premise is it's these art school kids. Well, I mean, this guy just finds blowing down the street. He finds this invitation to a murder party. And it just says, be here at this time. And he's like, okay. He makes himself a costume out of like a cardboard box. And he goes. And the and the art school kids are like serious. Like this is an artistic, you know, uh, it's a it's a it's a piece. It's an art piece. Um, they're going to actually murder somebody at this uh, party. And they're like, you know, well, if you're dumb enough to to you know come to something called a murder party you deserve, deserve to die you know that kind of thing so it has this kind of a dark dark humor um and but the thing i thought the writing and the casting like the characters it's like i knew all these people from art school they're like perfect perfectly uh cast and performed 
and so pompous and so, uh, you know, like uh, self uh, absorbed. Um, but it's also like grueling, the, like the, the gore, the violence, like that's something I, that he does so well, which I would say is kind of like, it's like Cronenberg does that where it's that visceral, like, sure. ah, like, and also I feel like um, Guillermo del Toro is one that does that very well. Um, who we haven't talked about yet, but like in uh, Pan's Labyrinth, there's like that part where he, the the guy's like bashing the guy's face with the the button with the he's, with the gun, and um, and then uh, another one that I remember from Guillermo del Toro is in uh, The Devil's Backbone, which is uh, one of his. You know, I think it was right before Pan's Labyrinth. The, mm -hmm. the guy gets stabbed in the under the arm, like in the armpit. And in the you know commentary, he's talking about like you know I you know I like to stab people in the armpit because or it's like because you actually feel that it's not like a, a, a flesh wound on the bicep it's like that makes you cringe right you know and there's there's a, there's an, there's an art to that and I feel like Jeremy Saulnier and like in in Green Room you know you could probably remember there's some stuff like that right there's some like yeah. horrific you know he doesn't glorify the violence he's like you don't want it you know <laughs> but it's it's interesting. Uh, you know, it's not, uh, it, it gives, you know, right. I, I don't know. I always get like kind of a, uh, I don't know. It, it's much more impactful. Uh, a physical reaction. There's only a few movies I've had like that, but I get it. Um, yeah. I was just thinking of bone Tomahawk. Have you seen that oh, one? A friend of mine was just watching that yesterday and, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's another example of exactly what, yeah. Of what I'm talking about. Like, where they hold on to it, and thank goodness that the uh, MPAA doesn't require uh, edits like they did in the '80s, because we wouldn't get stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I meant to look up uh, who made that because that was so well done, and it just kind of came out of nowhere, and and it had Kurt Russell, and I mean, like whoever did that had to have gone on and it done more cool stuff. He, I think he did. Uh, what is it? There's um, I'm going to look it up right now, but I think he did a movie with Vince Vaughn in prison. Hmm. Uh, I want to say like drag across concrete oh, or something. Okay. Let me see if I can find it here. I'll find the ad director. You go ahead. Yeah, it was uh, the, the director was S. Craig Zoller or Zoller, hmm. and he did uh, Brawl in Cell Block 99, and which was great. But he also had uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, he's a he's a good director. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's, I think Dragged Across Concrete was another one. And then, yeah, they put Helen Highwater and Green Room in similar types of movies. So it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say Blue Ruin, uh, I'd put that high on the list too. But that's like a, it's like a character study. Like um, it's Macon Blair. Basically, he's going, he's trying to get revenge uh, for his, like his sister. And um, right. he he just bumbles the whole thing. It, it's like, I guess the it's yeah the idea of like if just the average guy that doesn't actually have any skills is just like out for like gruesome revenge, but he just doesn't know what he's doing and and I don't know it's actually it's 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 a little bit of a rough watch but it's 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 yeah it's powerful. Okay. Uh, what else yeah. you got on your list for us? All right, let's see here. Um, well, I guess. Oh, okay. Okay. Here's one that I was, I was curious if you'd seen, because I, again, it's one of these movies that I, I bring it up sometimes and nobody seems to have ever heard of it. it uh, it's called May. Like it was in the, I think probably May? early two thousands. Yeah. M-A-Y. <clears throat> I don't think so. I always like hearing about films. I'm going to put it into IMDB while we're talking here. Yeah. And it and was, I thought it was great. Um, the lead actress, I don't think I've ever seen her in anything else, but she was amazing. And uh, Anna Ferris was in it. Um, I think it was maybe around the time that Scary Movie came out. Um, and it's like May oh, is this you. woman that she's sort of, uh, uh, well, she wants to build sort of a, a Frankenstein monster lover type creature it's, it's just kind of fun to see a woman uh, in that role instead of a creepy guy i bet you i bet you my wife i bet you becky has seen that she's seen more than i have and that seems like that'd be right up her alley i'll have to check with her after because i haven't seen it but i bet she has yeah yeah uh, um okay then i guess just a couple memory lane 
Uh, oh, oh, wait, no. Okay, Fast Zombies. Okay, maybe to, uh, you know, I'm not totally against Fast Zombies. Um, there was a <laughs> show um, on Netflix called Black Summer, I believe. Mm -hmm. It was a series, and they had Fast Zombies in that, and I actually did enjoy that. Did you see that? I did. It's um, it's a spinoff of something Z. What was that called? Um, oh, really? It, World War yeah. Z? No, not World oh. War Z. Uh, Dude. it was another one. It was really cheesy from sci-fi. Yeah. And somehow they're tied in, but Black Summer, yeah, Black Summer had the actress from My Name is Earl in it, I think. Um, yes. Uh Jamie Presley. Jamie or Presley. Jane. Yeah, the one that all look the same. There's three or four actresses that all look the same. She's one of them. Not yeah, is it King? James King, maybe not yeah, Presley. I knew who he, yeah, she my daughter, if she was still listening, would know because she's a huge My Name is Earl fan. But yeah, that wasn't bad. I, I you know, it was, um, I could I could handle that for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me see. Yeah. And yeah, uh, any others on your list? Um, 80s uh, horror comedy type stuff. Again, stuff that I grew up at loving. Uh, House 2. Okay. Um, yep. Critters. Uh <laughs> And Critters, too. Which, How about Tremors? Tremors. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. That's, yeah, that stands above. It's probably my favorite. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and just the cast and stuff, too. Like, so perfect. Uh, <laughs> well, like, Reba McIntyre and, and and the Family Ties guy. Like, so they're, it, it just everything. It was just perfectly, yeah, cast and written just so much fun the script every everything it is a perfect and i only saw it for the first time maybe seven years ago and i've probably seen it a dozen times since it is i don't know if you could maybe Shaun of the dead but a better horror comedy if you want to call it that i mean it was just oh and and the it's weird to say but the chemistry between uh, kevin bacon and fred ward perfect yeah. the way yeah. they played yeah. off each other they yeah, I mean, oh, that was, yeah, perfect movie. Yeah, right, and the effects were good, and yeah, it was, yeah, it was great, yeah. That was, like, probably one of the, well, I don't know, I want to say that's, it feels like that was, like, shortly before things started going more CGI, you know, I bet the sequels started incorporating CGI in there, but, like, all those, so, uh, uh, what do you want to call it, uh, an Easter egg, but there's a clip, an audio clip from that movie that uh, Bert, um, uh, his name the uh the prepper and anyway uh oh, yeah. he's in my intro my uh, podcast mm -hmm. intro the very oh, last yeah. uh voice clip is from him and uh yeah. where he's like uh what is i forget how many gallons of water and so many days of food and i was like yeah that's so perfect but i love that right movie. yeah there was something else in your intro i was going to bring up there was a uh that i appreciated the uh the reference was it uh from um twilight zone monsters mm -hmm. on maple street Mm, no, so it wasn't. and well, it might have been uh, Panic at Year Zero. That's in there as well. Uh, that's probably my favorite early apocalyptic prepper movie. Hmm. Um, oh, there's also uh, Spock, Leonard Nimoy from the Y2K documentary. <laughs> I can't believe I can remember all these. It, I, it was a full day last year putting it together, but I I was so happy with the ending of it. But yeah, 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 that's fun. It, yeah, it's I like it. I like it. It's good. It, um, yeah, well, and I guess uh, I just made a note uh, on Critters 2 actually was uh, directed by Mick Garris, who did The Stand. I believe he did the original Stand miniseries. Oh, okay. Um, and he also did Hocus Pocus, the original Hocus Pocus. Or he Which wrote it anyway. I'd only seen the first time three, four years ago, and I really enjoyed it. Had never seen it before. Yeah, I didn't. I tried to watch it last year. I'd never seen it either. And I feel like, you know, it's intended for, you know, preteens or something. It's kind of how I felt about it. Like, it's oh, like yeah. I missed it in the 90s. And it, it, I just felt like it wasn't for me anymore. I went to, uh, it was our local theater, and they had a trivia night where everybody dressed up in a costume. So maybe that added to the mystique of it. But I really, really enjoyed it. So uh, White had put it, Burt Gummer, that's his name, um, uh, the, the prepper from uh, from Tremors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I guess along uh, Motel Hell is another uh, great 80s. Oh, yes. That's not bad. I've seen it. It's been a while since I've seen that one too, but yes. Did, yeah. What about, uh, did you happen to see Terrifier 2 this year? No, I haven't seen 
Yeah, no, I haven't seen any of the Terrifier stuff. So I, I hadn't they're... seen the first one. And the second one just, it was, um, they raised money using uh, Kickstarter. And it become this huge kind of pop culture zeitgeist thing. And so I was like, all right, we got to watch it. Now, Becky didn't like it. But it is, it's another one of those like creepy, you know, makes your skin crawl kind of like just really balls to the wall horror and violence you know and gore mm -hmm. and i really enjoyed it but i think i liked the soundtrack more huh. and the soundtrack was done by the guitarist for marilyn manson and okay. so i went online i'm like oh anyway it wasn't available i ordered it through another kickstarter where they you know how they do that with vinyl now where you can you pay ahead of time and then they'll print them so i got it and i i listen to that all the time it's really good mm -hmm. so if you get a chance because i know you like practical effects and you know ultra gore it's worth watching for that alone. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard both sides of it. Like uh, I know people that love it and I know people that hate it, that just think it's over the top and you know, nothing, but it's like, I mean, I, that's what I mean. That's... He needed an editor. I think he edited <laughs> uh, his own film. A lot of guys that ends up happening, you know, they kind of, they, they believe their own hype and I get it, but it didn't need to be like two and a half hours long. It would have been really good at like an hour 40, you know? Uh, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was just having a conversation about uh, that uh, regarding, um, well, both George Lucas and uh, Tim Burton. Uh, not, I mean, not specifically, uh, basically they, you know, got, well, I think in the case of Tim Burton, you know, he kind of, I feel like he needs somebody to rein him in a little bit. Oh, nowadays. I wish Tim Burton would go back and make 1980s Tim Burton films. Yes. I oh, mean, yeah. I they were so good. What happened? How do you go from making Edward Scissorhands to making... Uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And, you know, if 1980s Tim Burton made Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, it'd be awesome. But whatever the hell that disgrace was, was absolute hot dog shit. It was yes. so bad. Yeah, yeah, right. And I think that's what it is. You know, back then, well, like, I feel like uh, what, you know, what I said is I feel like he'd be, right as right now, he'd be better off just being like a production designer, you know, because he still has, you know, he's visually interesting. Yes. Stuff. But he, I think, in the early days, he had the vision. He had the, you know, the, uh, you know, the way he wanted everything to look and be. But he also had to answer to a producer and a, you know, drink in a, a studio. And then he, you know, became, uh, you know, so successful that he didn't have to answer to anybody. And and that's what this is what happens, you know. <laughs> a really good example of that. I, I don't know if you ever watched it, but Sons of Anarchy. Did you ever watch yeah. that? No, I didn't. So Kurt Sutter, he he really got huge off that show. And the first two, you can watch as the seasons go on, the episodes get longer and longer and longer. Mm -hmm. And they were all taut, you know, and sharp and, and to the point, the first two, three seasons. By the final season, you knew. He's like, hey, I've got, uh, you know, I got lightning in a bottle here. You can't do anything about it. And I'm going to. So they would go from being a, you know, a 40 minute episode to being like almost two hours. And they were just. Dude, dude needed an editor and he needed a producer saying, sorry, buddy, you got to rein this in a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's something. Uh, yeah, well, like I was saying earlier about, you know, filmmaking stuff, I think that's part of appreciating the um, the team. You know, like that's, well, something uh, like, well, years ago, so where I live, it's pretty rural area, not a lot of filmmaking happening. Um and I'm just too stubborn to go anywhere, you know, <laughs> where I could it. actually do something. Um, but uh, I started a club um, to just see who was around that would come in and, you know, collaborate. And, uh, and uh, you know, kind of along with that, I, I started kind of thinking about the, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I wrote like a manifesto about filmmaking and everything. But just like I've always, once I started thinking about it, it just the magic, the the synergy of, you know, filmmaking is the only art form that incorporates every other art form. Sure. You know, like music, you know, from music to you know, photography, makeup, you know, painting, you know, literally every single art form is represented. Huh. And as a producer or a director, you know, like I, I believe that a good director, their job is to find the right person for each of those roles, not to micromanage, you know, and I think this is applicable in business too. Um, and you just find the right person, put them in the role and let them do what they do best. Like, cause like, I don't want to, you know, 
I don't want to, you know, I, I hire an accountant because I don't want to do that stuff. You know, it's like they're going to find those those. Uh, uh, what, what do you well, call the, it? The, the, the skilled professionals, the people who can do the job better than you can. So it can free you up to do the things you want to do, I'm guessing. Yeah, right. Yeah. And and not only free me up, but it makes the overall product better. Because sure. you've got all these people like pursuing their passions like under the umbrella of the overall production. Um, you know, as long as you know you give them, you know, they, of course they do require a little direction, but you know, to make sure that no people aren't going off on their own tangents. But but yeah, like that's what I love about filmmaking is it, it was like being on the set of that the short we shot. Um I just kind of was hanging around and and the one of the writers was talking to the costumer uh, and, and I, don't, I wish I could remember it, you know, better, but, you know, she was like, showed him a, you know, her iPad with, you know, a dress on it. And it's like, is this kind of what you're thinking? And he's like, no, no more. Uh, you know, I was thinking it's like flowery, but not. And and she's like, Oh, okay. Hot topic meets, uh, you know, wh whatever. And she like pulled something else up and he's like, yeah, yeah, that. And I was just like, that's awesome. I, you know, th it's like a, it seems like a small thing, but just having somebody to bounce that off of that can interpret what your vision is and then produce it. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. That's really cool, man. I think it, I think that might be a good spot for us to, to wind her up. I was like, that's a really good thought to end, <laughs> end the show on. And I appreciated this. So where I'm okay. So I guess right at the moment you don't have, places to for social or anything along those lines at least to follow you with right yeah i just have like i just have kind of my personal stuff i i started a new production company because basically i just all this stuff all this producing stuff i've been doing has just been within the last like six months uh and it's all kind of i'm just dealing with the filmmaker they're making the thing and they're putting it out or selling it to distributor or whatever so there isn't really any reason uh, that i'm seeing for for anybody to reach out to me, I'm like finding them right now, but it's like, that's, that's kind of the next step, I guess. And well, and I do have, you know, stuff I've shot in the past and, and actually I am wanting to get back into the technical kind of behind the scenes side of things too. I actually, um, one of my favorite parts of, uh, of the process that I feel like I actually is pretty good at is the editing. Hmm. Um, so I'm, I actually have been talking to another production studio about, being an editor on something. Um, and, and in that case, I probably want some kind of a portfolio and, and I do have stuff out there, but it's all, you know, it's 15 years ago. I don't know that I want that to represent me now. Time to uh, build a new portfolio. Yeah. And I, I think, I mean, there's some good stuff that I'll, I'll, uh, I just need to curate it a little bit more. So I, yeah, I don't really have anywhere that I would send anybody <laughs> to, to, see me or my stuff well, if people want to reach out to you they can reach out to me through email and i can put you into contact for sure as well and yeah I, you know for what it's worth man i'd love to have you back on if you're up for it yeah definitely yeah i mean i i love to talk as you probably noticed <laughs> i just want to christopher said it's always a privilege to listen to someone who is articulate passionate knowledgeable and proficient in their field thanks tim and will yeah wow, i really appreciate that it's good to hear <laughs> and uh, we'll have to do more movie episodes too, because I uh, I love picking your brain, and I think we bounce off each other pretty good. So, yeah, oh yeah, and I like, well, I mean, and this was just horror. I'm 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 into, you know, I can go into all kinds of <laughs> genres and directors and minutia. I would appreciate it. Well, thank you, Will. If you want to hang around in the background for just a second, I, I'll be right back with you. All right, guys, I hope you appreciated that. That that was everything I wanted and then some. So thanks for hanging with us. Thanks for letting me breathe into some of my other passions on this on this show. Because I, I know, like, it's not just prepping. It's not just entrepreneurship. And I know we go down some different rabbit holes, but it helps me keep it fresh. It helps me talk about things that I love. But more importantly, it lets me bring on people like Will, who... I've met in real life on multiple occasions. We've drank together. We've chatted together. We didn't have enough time. And I wanted to bring him on to share his passions. So guys, as he, as he grows his portfolio, I will get him back on. We'll get him to share some of his stuff. And uh, 
before too long, we'll see him on Netflix, Amazon, or maybe on the big screen. How's that sound? So with that, guys, as always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week.